Now you can see then that the administrative and procedural matters will run the train off the track for the next six years. Now let's suppose that we're going to go forward though in a motion hearing. Let's see the court then proceed against me again or against another party. Let's just sit here and argue some motions. Let's just go through the routine of five or six motions. Sometimes I don't raise these administrative and procedural matters and run the train off the track because, you know, if the train's off the track, you can't have any fun. I think that I'm going to have a jury trial finally, and I <clears throat> normally file a folder this thick. I think I have a folder with about two or three motions, and I want to go to trial because I want to get a basic question before the Supreme Court of the United States. And to do that, I had to uh, tone down my entire process because we call this derailing trains. And you know, you get out there and derail the train, it takes a long time to get the thing back on the track, and the government's slow and ponderous. And if you want to have any fun, sometimes you're going to have to uh, waive some of these procedures so that you can get on to the jury trial. But you have to make sure that you have some appealable issues, bedrock, concrete, cast in stone type issues that you know you're going to win on. All right, with that then, let's take a look at just arguing some plain everyday garden variety motions before the court. Mr. Cook, this is your motion hearing. You are Mr. Cook, yes. Uh, are you ready to proceed? Yes, <clears throat> Your Honor, I'm ready to proceed. I believe I'm ready to proceed today. I picked out numerous motions here. I think, Your Honor, that your motions are numbered. And if you'll look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see some numbers, and I would like to start with number 16. This is the first motion to bring before the court today. That's a notice and demand for a hearing to suppress evidence. Okay, Your Honor, the uh, purpose of today's motion hearing and this particular motion is to suppress evidence that was gained illegally and unlawfully by the police officers at the alleged scene of the crime. It appears that the officers seized one 1965 Chevrolet automobile as evidence. The automobile, of and by itself, I contend, was seized illegally and unlawfully in violation of Idaho Code 49 1109 and it was seized without a search warrant and it was in violation of the Weeks Doctrine in Weeks versus U.S. 1911. The question, I think, before the court is whether or not the trial court can allow evidence which is so challenged to be used against the defendant in this case. It's obvious that if the evidence is used and it's ruled in a higher court to be incompetent evidence, that the entire case then would be overturned or in the, in the event that a trial a new trial was ordered, it would just add extra expense to this entire proceeding. Now, the specific problem that I have with the confiscation of the 1965 automobile is this. The officers had no reason to believe that that automobile contained marijuana in the trunk. They had stopped me, the defendant, for no license plate. Now, under Idaho Code 491109, there are only six specific items for which an arrest may be made. The officer stated that his only probable cause for stopping me was that the automobile had no license plate. When the officer approached my automobile, I got out of the car and I agreed to tell him my name, address, and sign the ticket. Therefore, the arrest and the impounding and then the finding of the contraband in the automobile were done in violation of state statute. They were done in violation of the Fourth Amendment to the Federal Constitution and Article I, Section 3 of the state constitution wherein our state constitution is bound by the Federal Constitution and it also specifically states that without a warrant, without probable cause, without reasonable suspicion under Terry versus Ohio, that this particular search was illegal and unlawful. And it's for that reason that I wish this hearing 
to suppress evidence and to have the state then present all of the evidence that it has seized so that this court may at that time, during that hearing, listen to witnesses who were present at the scene or the alleged scene of the crime, the alleged impoundment, and to listen and then weigh my affidavits and to suppress this evidence. Well, um, Mr. Gordon, or uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. Cook, has put on some very good arguments, but um, in the interest of the welfare of the citizens of this state, Mr. Gordon was pulled over because his automobile had no license plate. The defendant is Mr. Cook. The, excuse me. The defendant, Mr. Cook, um, his car had no license plates. And um, we could not get any statements from Mr. Cook as to um, where this car or whom it belonged to or anything. So we had to seize this car to make sure that it hadn't been stolen since Mr. Cook wouldn't cooperate. Um, we had every reason to believe since he wouldn't cooperate that he had to be hiding something and we believe that this car at the time may have been stolen or acquired improperly. And that's... Well, in rebuttal, I think this is a pretty weak argument the state is attempting to put on its opposition to the uh, evidentiary hearing and as I've already stated I'm prepared and I have filed an affidavit with the court stating that the exact circumstances surrounding the seizure of the automobile and the state has not refuted that affidavit. All I'm here today to do, Your Honor, is to move the court to listen to a hearing to suppress evidence. I'm not here presenting evidence or it, nor is the state here to present its uh, rebuttal but uh, rather just to motion up the hearing. And I'm entitled to that hearing as a matter of due process, and I would contend that if I'm denied the hearing and the opportunity to present witnesses and evidence to show clearly, concisely, and absolutely that the evidence was seized illegally and unlawfully, the court may be led into reversible error through its own omissions by failing to schedule such a hearing. And I think it's in the best interest of the taxpayers and the court and in the interest of justice and in the interest of the prosecutor and in the interest of the defendant to at least schedule the hearing to listen to the facts, to listen to the evidence. Your Honor. Okay. I think the defendant has uh, gotten the last word here. Uh, it appears to the court that the defendant has uh, presented a substantial case where a hearing is press evidence. This motion hearing is not a hearing to suppress evidence. It's merely a hearing to decide whether we will schedule a hearing to suppress evidence. So we don't want to hear the case right now. Uh, we'll set a time at some time and we'll be notified as when the hearing will be held. Well, Your Honor, uh, could we set that? Uh, excuse me, Your Honor. Just go ahead. Uh, now, could we set a hearing today so that we could get uh, your calendar with mine? My calendar is pretty busy, and I'd like to know if we could have the suppression hearing within the next two weeks. Now let's see what the court calendar is. Uh, Your Honor, I do have uh, March 8th and 9th open if it's uh, available here to the public. Uh, the court has some cases on that date. How about the March 15th? Would that be... Well, I'm terribly sorry, Your Honor. I'll be in trial March 15th. Well, the next available date for the court is March 22nd then, so... Uh... All right, I have March 22nd open. How about the state? Is the state still... I'm sure somebody from the state will be ready to proceed on that. Very good. We'll set the hearing in for March 22nd. And what time? At uh, 1.30 p.m. Okay. In this courtroom. 1.30, March 22nd, in this courtroom, 102. Exactly. Thank you, Your Honor. The next motion I have to present is a notice of demand for affidavit in support of the complaint. Now, Your Honor, I've demanded all of my rights and demanded all of my rights timely. Pursuant to Rule 4, I believe, of the Idaho Rules of Criminal Procedure, I'm entitled to, if I make timely demand, an affidavit and a formal complaint. Now, I've been given these traffic citations, and I contend that the traffic citation does not contain the necessary information and elements su supporting or substantiating the allegations against me. So, therefore, I'd like to demand two things today as a matter of right pursuant to rule. And that is 
a formal complaint from the prosecutor supported by affidavit or oath at the probable cause hearing so that I might know who my accusers are so that I will then know who to subpoena into any further hearings and the trial in my own defense. Your Honor, um, we have um, the affidavit in the form of an oral statement taken under oath from um, Officer Deacon um, at the probable cause hearing um, that was held on January 16th, um, at which time the officer did state um, under oath that Mr. Cook was driving the automobile and did commit said crimes. Mr. Cook? I'm sure that all of this is true, but I'm also sure that the prosecutor is not conforming to the rules. I didn't ask him to tell me who these people were. I said I wanted in writing, and I'm entitled to this information in writing as a matter of law. Now, I'm not asking for it. I'm demanding it as a matter of law and as a matter of rule. I want a formal complaint, and I want the affidavit in support of the complaint, or I want the tape. And I'm entitled to it, and I'm simply demanding it, and I think that the rule speaks for itself. Well, Mr. Cook, you're entitled to a formal complaint if you uh, request one. However, as far as having your probable cause hearing, uh, I think you'll find that the Idaho Code provides for the probable cause hearing to be held as the state has said. And uh, so that will be denied. Probable cause hearing has already been held. Your Honor, the court, I perceive, is misunderstanding the point of this particular motion. I'm not asking the court for a probable cause hearing. I'm asking the court for the affidavit in support of the complaint pursuant to Rule 4. Mr. Gordon, uh, in, uh, testimony given under oath at the probable cause hearing takes the place of the affidavit. So, uh, you can get a tape of the testimony and that will suffice. Would you order the prosecutor to provide that for me, Your Honor? Yes, you will provide Mr. Cook with a opportunity to hear the tape of the hearing. Yes, Your Honor. Will tomorrow be soon enough? Yes, thank you, Mr. Prosecutor. Next motion I'd like to take up, Your Honor, is motion number 25, Notice and Demand for Rights, Sua Sapanti. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Notice and demand for right sui sapati is a rather simple and elementary demand. I'm appearing in propriety persona, and the court has denied me counsel, and so now that I'm compelled to move forward without counsel, I feel it incumbent to demand my rights pursuant to the common law. Now, from time to time, certain rules and certain rights may come available to me that I may not be aware of. Should this occur, under the common law rule, it's incumbent upon the judge of the court to inform the defendant of the right as it becomes available, lest that right become waived. The word sua sapati means now, or right now. Therefore, as an example, and sometimes prosecutors have misunderstood this motion and the, and the reason for it, <clears throat> I have not been to law school, and therefore, pursuant to the Supreme Court's determination in a case that I've forgotten right now, but I'll be happy to supply to the court if it's necessary, a pro se or a person appearing in his own behalf cannot be held to the same standards as an attorney. And therefore, using that doctrine from the Supreme Court of the United States, I'd like to remind the court that I'm here in proprietor persona, and that if a right or if a procedure becomes available to me that would jeopardize or that would waive a right, then I'm making demand upon the court to tell me of that right before I lose it or it's waived. Your Honor, this, this motion here is... Um, we have given Mr. Cook here every opportunity to have counsel. 
and every opportunity to have somebody that is qualified to help Mr. Go Mr. Cook um, understand what the rules are and what his rights are and how this um, proceeding is to be conducted. He is asking that the judge conduct his defense from the bench and protect him from errors that he may make um, from not knowing. Um, by his own will and uh, demand, he is here acting uh, and wishing to represent himself. And I, I uh, move the court that we um, deny this motion and let Mr. Cook proceed the best he can. Well, I, as I said, the state would misrepresent and misunderstand my position. They seem to do that consistently and continually, Your Honor. And I'm not asking the court to conduct my defense. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that this court or any of its offices are competent enough to conduct my defense, and that's why I'm conducting my defense myself. Mr. Cook, what's your words? Well, I'm sorry, Your Honor, if I've offended the court in some way. There is no personal charges being made in any way, shape, form, or manner. The reason I make these comments is that the Chief Justice of the United States has said at a meeting of the American Bar Association in 1977 that 90% of the trial lawyers were incompetent. And that was my fear, and that is my fear today. And Of course, I wanted an ex-friend, or I wanted counsel, but the court and the uh, Supreme Court now has ruled that this court may move forward and I cannot have counsel, but nevertheless, I feel that we're still faced with the common law rule for my demand for my right sui sponte. And I'm not asking the court to conduct my defense. I'm not asking the court to interrogate or cross-examine witnesses. And I'm not asking the judge of the court <coughs> to uh, make any objections. What I am demanding is this. In the event that I have a right to make a challenge to the state's prima facie case when the state rests, as an example, should I forget, or should, through the excitement of the trial, forget to make that timely demand? It is absolutely necessary, and it is absolutely incumbent upon the trial judge to stop the proceedings immediately and remind the defendant that he does have a right available to challenge the state's prima facie case. And that's a far cry, Your Honor, from asking the court in any particular instance to conduct or to handle the defense in any way, shape, form, or manner. I'm simply making a timely demand pursuant to the common law that the court inform me of rights as they become available, not to exercise those rights for me. I think... Uh Defense has the last rebuttal in this case. Um, as far as counsel goes, and with regard to your rights to respond, you have uh, never been denied the right to counsel. You still have the right to counsel your choice to assist you in determining your rights. But you can get a lawyer anytime you wish. You keep mentioning in your defense that you. Uh, want to have the common law applied here, and I will remind you that we're not in common law, and this is equity, and the, the common law rules will apply. The court seeks justice just as much as you do, Mr. Cook, and will do what it see will take such action as it seems appropriate to ensure that your rights are protected, or the court will not presume to remind you of every single right which you may have because you are acting your own behalf and should know those rights. <clears throat> so we'll deny your motion for rights to us, Monty. All right, Your Honor. The next issue to be brought up is the affidavit of status. That's number 31. I think at this time it's necessary to uh, remind the court to take judicial notice of the defendant's status. You have mentioned that we are in equity and that... Uh, that is an admission insofar as this defendant's concerned. The defendant here is a citizen at the common law and demands all of his rights at the common law. And I deny any jurisdiction of mercantile equity, admiralty, 
or any foreign jurisdiction other than the common law. And I've demanded that the court assert proof said jurisdiction, and that issue then is moot at this time. However, it is a continuing objection to the jurisdiction of the court, and this affidavit of status will stand unless the state can refute my affidavit of status and claim that I am in some kind of equity and I demand that this prosecutor or the state produce any evidence that would uh, reduce my status to that of anything other than a common law citizen at the common law. We have your affidavit on file. I think at, your, at this time, Your Honor, uh, the next affidavit then of poverty, which is number... We have your affidavit. You don't need to argue those before the court. Well, <clears throat> I would like to have a ruling on these two or I would like you to just ignore them. I'd like the record to be set so that when the appeals process looks at them, they don't have to wonder what it's doing there. The court has read your affidavits, Mr. Cook. But this, Your Honor, is oral argument in support of these affidavits, motions, and briefs, and I demand to be heard, and if I'm not heard, then I'm being denied due process. I have a comment to make about an affidavit of poverty. I don't see that any ruling is necessary on an affidavit. The affidavit speaks for itself, Mr. Cook. Will the court take judicial notice of the affidavit? The court has read your affidavit, Mr. Cook. That's not the answer, Your Honor. Has the court taken judicial notice of the affidavit? The court has taken judicial notice of your affidavit. Thank you, Your Honor. Then we need not discuss it any further. Next issue to be brought up. Thank you at this time, Your Honor. Let's take up the subject matter of a notice and demand for rights and support of demand for dismissal. That's number 11. And I believe today I'll close with just these last two. I have a notice and demand for dismissal because the statute exceeds the police power, but I wanted to briefly talk about the subject of rights. Have you had an opportunity to read my brief? Yes, the court read your brief. Okay. Is the court taking judicial notice of this brief and of the citations from the Constitution of the State of Idaho and the Constitution of the United States, and more specifically, uh, the Supreme Court decisions pursuant to rights. The court, as you well know, always takes judicial notice of all the constitutions of the state and the United States. And it is read your brief. Okay. Well, in that case, there is no real reason to read this to you other than to uh, obtain for the record this court's admission that it has taken judicial notice of my rights. And that being the case, we can move on then to number 18. Number 18 is a notice of demand for dismissal. The statute exceeds the police power of the state. Are you ready? Everybody on find their place? My contention here, Your Honor, is that the executive branch of government is using the police powers to extract taxes from citizens in violation of the doctrine of the separation of powers. And that the police powers of the state are not now, nor have they ever been intended to collect or raise revenue. And that the revenue raising procedure originates in the House of Representatives or in the state level in the House of Representatives. And it does not originate with city councils, county commissioners, or in police departments and sheriff's departments who are issuing traffic citations and tickets for the purpose of dragging citizens who are under contract with driver's licenses, registrations, etc., into the courts so that they can be fleeced or taxed, if we would put it that way, fines, pains, penalties, in violation of this doctrine of the separation of powers. 
Now, this particular case is, a, is oppressively obnoxious in that the defendant has stipulated that he has no driver's license. And without a driver's license, this court lacks jurisdiction. And so this citizen has been hauled into a foreign and alien jurisdiction for the purpose of collecting taxes using the police powers of the state. The police powers were never intended for this, and my motion for dismissal is based upon this violation of the police powers doctrine. And the brief in support will show you from our state constitution, plain language, that how and in what manner this taxation is being extracted or being used to extract funds from citizens. It is our contention that the officers always act within the letter of the law in which they're told. They're only obeying the laws the legislature has written. I don't think that we have any officers out there that are maliciously acting outside the scope of their police powers. Well, Your Honor, the prosecuting attorney here misunderstands the thrust and intent of the motion itself. I'm sure that the police officers, who are in fact agents and not officers, are acting within the scope of their orders and their duties. I don't have any problem with the police officer acting within the scope of his duty, and there isn't one word in here that claims that the policemen are acting outside the scope of their duty. The issue isn't the policemen. The issue is the constitution of the state and the application of the police powers to extract tax money in violation of the doctrine of the separation of powers. We're talking about the doctrine of the separation of powers and the constitution, not the duties and the orders of a policeman. And I don't think the prosecutor understands the issue. Well, Mr. Cook, I think you're right. Based on what I've heard today, I'm going to dismiss this case. Case dismissed. Thank you, Your Honor. Procedure is spelled with two E's in the middle. Garrow, C-E-D-U-R-E. That's what we were trying for. Couldn't come up with it, though. We don't have another E? No, not a B. All gone bye-bye. Well, now you've just seen some courtroom drama. That's the kind of courtroom drama that you're going to see in the state of Idaho. Whether you're in Texas or Illinois or some other state can make a big difference. Well, I shouldn't say too big a difference, but it'll make some difference in the way you proceed. Now, I'd like to comment for a moment, if I might, on Judge Curtis. Judge Curtis is a pretty benevolent judge. Typically, in the lower courts, you're going to find this kind of a syndrome. Have you ever heard the old story that a buck private walks up to a PFC or to a sergeant and he forgets to salute and the sergeant comes unglued, you know, like the sergeant does with Beetle Bailey and just lays his cane with him? But if the same private forgot to salute a general, the general would probably walk on by and never be ruffled by it because a general has got so much power and authority, he doesn't really care whether or not that private salutes him. Well, the courts are sort of like that also. The higher you get, and when you're talking to a Supreme Court judge or you're talking to a district court judge, even a court of original jurisdiction, those judges don't seem to hold the same kind of standards of absolute obedience to every rule and crossing every T and dotting every I as do the lower court judges. And they have so much more knowledge and ability. Let me give you an illustration. I was up in our federal district court not long ago, and I won't mention the judge's name because he's probably known coast to coast. But this particular judge, I was sitting in the back of the courtroom and this young lady came in and she was the object of the hearing of the day and it was an order to show cause for contempt of court and the IRS wanted to get some information from her. This judge still opened the proceedings and the young lady said, well, I need counsel, your honor, and my counsel is sitting right back here and I'd like to have counsel. And the judge never batted an eyelash. He just said, well, who's your counsel? And she said, well, his name is George Gordon. Okay, Mr. Gordon, come on up, sit down. I sat down and he said, now, are you a licensed member of the bar? 
No, I'm not. Oh, okay. He didn't even ask the prosecutor whether he objected. He didn't care. If the prosecutor didn't want an unlicensed member of the bar there, he can file charges for somebody practicing law without a license or do whatever he wants. The difference there is that here's a federal court judge and he doesn't really care about this Mickey Mousing around with the council issue of protecting the union. He doesn't need to. He's probably appointed uh, for life and it's not relevant to him whether or not somebody approves or disapproves of his actions. Now, when you're talking to a magistrate judge in Idaho, they're elected <clears throat> by popular vote. And of course, they're under the scrutiny of the State Bar Association, so they're extremely careful about interpreting the statute in light of protecting the union. So when you go into the courtroom and you demand counsel and the judge refuses to give you counsel or gives you a hard time or comes down hard on you and puts on the role of the prosecutor and that you're sitting in there with a prosecutorial judge and a prosecutor, don't even let that bother you. What you need to do is to get your objections in timely. Now, you'll notice that I said that you could appeal these counsel and judicial determinations and uh, uh, jurisdiction to the Supreme Court before you've gone to trial. I don't want to lead you astray. There is a, a particular rule that's involved here in Idaho pursuant to that, and I want to take a moment here and explain that to you because it may or may not be the rule in the state where you are. If you have the trial judge's permission, you can appeal counsel and jurisdiction on up the line until those two issues are decided, or any other major issue under Rule 54.6 that you have the approval of that judge, and you may or may not have that judge's approval. So typically, the way to run a case to the Supreme Court in Washington runs through this scenario. Now listen to this scenario because this is the way it runs all the time, every day, garden variety. You get a ticket, or you have the charge made against you. You walk into the court and you stand mute and challenge the jurisdiction of the court. You file 20 or 30 motions and briefs outlining your theory of the case and your demand for rights. You come into trial, the judge railroads you through a kangaroo administrative law court. The jury finds you guilty, or if there is no jury or no court of record, you automatically appeal trial de novo or appeal pursuant to rule, and in this state it's pursuant to Rule 54, to the district court. The district court will review your case, and they will turn it down, and you will appeal then to your state Supreme Court. In Idaho, we have an appeals court. The state Supreme Court will kick it over to the appeals court. The appeals court may or may not rule for you. They will. That's your first opportunity to have a constitutional issue decided. If they rule against you, you appeal to your state Supreme Court. If they won't hear it, or if they do hear it and they rule against you, then you file with the federal Supreme Court and the rules of, of uh, filing with the federal Supreme Court. Uh, we have them here. It'll be a long time before you get ready to do that, so I'll burden you with all these extra rules. Here's the solution. Remember, when you don't know something, what do you do? You go to your law librarian and say, Sweetheart, I need this information. Where do I go? See how easy that is? Using the old Edison principle, I don't know what to do, but I need to know where I can go find out. Now, this thing of rules is very important, and I'm going to bring up this thing called rules right now. Zero in on this, would you over there, friend? These are called the Idaho Court Rules, and you're going to get this book with this tape. If you can get it focused, there it is. Idaho Court Rules. It's probably a 200-page book. Let's take a look in here. It doesn't say how many pages, but I'd say there's about 200 pages of rules here. <clears throat> now get a pen and paper out, and let's run through this scenario, because this is absolutely crucial. This is one of those positions in your education now where you've got to take a note or two and you've got to memorize this because this you've got to get right. The rules of procedure nationwide are relatively similar. The federal rules of criminal and civil procedure are generally adopted by all of the several states. All right, now that's a broad statement and that's called a general statement. Now, there are also exceptions to rules. 
And so the exceptions to your rules will be found in your state code. In Idaho, it's called the Idaho Code. And in the Idaho Code, we have the Idaho Rules of Civil Procedure that govern in civil cases. Then we have the Idaho Rules of Criminal Procedure, which you have here. The Idaho Misdemeanor Rules, which you have here. And let's see here in the back of this book if you have the 4th Judicial District Rules. Here's the appellate practice under the Idaho Appellate Rules. And... Uh, the magistrate rules. Here's a list of our district court judges. Yes, here's the district court rules for the 4th Judicial District of the state of Idaho. And we have uh, in the front of it the Idaho rules of criminal procedure and the Idaho court administrative rules. All right. Now, I don't care whether you're in Texas or Alabama or New York or where you are. You read this book for the purpose, if you're not in Idaho now and you're out in some other state, you read this with the purpose of finding out what the general scope of the rules are. You must then go down to your local law library and you've got to have, now remember, this course is outlined to do the criminal defense. So you don't need your civil procedure rules. Remember, you're staying on the common law side and you want criminal practice. You can't play the game if you don't know the rules. Now, that's absolutely an imperative. Now, I'm going to repeat that. That's how important it is. You can't play the game if you don't know the rules. With the Idaho court rules, if you're in Idaho, this is all you're going to need because this is the book that you're going to practice from. But you want to remember that this is as of 1982. And in the back of every one of those law books, there's a, there's a little pamphlet back there called a supplement. And every time you check a rule, you make sure you check the supplement because remember that that code is updated every time your legislature is in session, they're passing new laws and then it goes into the supplement.